Well, time it to a banana and roll me in the chocolate. All right, welcome, welcome. If you're new to the channel, my name is Elliot with Rickety Ski Reviews, and today we're gonna talk about something a little bit different. This is a subject I've been like avoiding really heavily, but I do feel like it's probably time to talk about it. Back in 2015, I worked for Ski Racing Magazine. It was like this big job that I applied for and got, and I was just blown away that I got it. I grew up as a kid reading Ski Racing Magazine in rural Vermont. I would like cut out the pictures of the skiers and put them on my wall. I just thought it was like the coolest thing. So in 2015, when I applied and got the job, I was blown away. I was like, oh my God, my life is finally like happening after graduating college. This is my dream come true. But it quickly kind of turned into a nightmare. I was told that I would need to relocate from Idaho and go to Park City, Utah. I was also only offered a salary of about $30,000. But at the time I still accepted, I said, oh, who cares about money? This is my dream job. I'm finally gonna be able to, you know, talk to ski racers about ski racing. I'm gonna be able to go to Europe. I'm gonna do all these things. Who cares about 30,000? My wife and I move from an affordable area in Idaho over to Park City. We quickly realized that none of the apartments in Park City were even close to affordable, especially on a $30,000 salary. So we had to like live in a neighboring city. We had to like then commute. We could barely afford childcare. I couldn't even afford full five days for my daughter. I could only afford four days of childcare. Then I was also like writing these articles and I was told that I needed to be near Park City but no one else actually lived there. They told me I couldn't live in Salt Lake but then half of the other staff lived in Salt Lake. And this is just kind of the first inklings I got that this dream job wasn't gonna be everything I thought it was. Ski racing didn't even have an office. They had us working in the US ski team's center of excellence and we would kind of work. Uh, and that office didn't really have anything set up. We were just given an empty cubicle. <laughs> <laughs> I had to use like my own computer, my own workstation. Yeah, so I would just like go to the library to work because it was so much less distracting than just like this empty cubicle area. There was no real place for me to be set up. And why I had to live in Park City when there was no office and I had to zoom in or whatever, uh, what was it at the time, Skype. I had to Skype into all these meetings where people were all over. And they didn't pay me enough that I could even afford to live in Park City. So, you know, we were just kind of struggling to get by. Um, my wife had a job, but it was like, it was brutal. It was brutal. I, I mean, I loved Utah. The skiing was gonna be great, but where we had to live was kind of not nice. We had to live in this crappy apartment complex. It was a nightmare. I'm probably getting a little too hung up, but it was just kind of the first red flags that I ignored because I was young and I was excited about this position. After I got hired on, I was an editor. So I was producing content. I needed to reach out to people, get interviews, things like that, and then produce content. So I was like very excited about this part. I had some really cool content I wanted to write. A lot of these actually have turned into video ideas now where I'm like, oh, I never got to talk about that. Let's talk about this. I would want to talk about things like helmet safety. Like I wrote this one piece called The Truth About helmets. It is by far one of the most popular articles that's ever come out of ski racing. I like had access to the metrics and it was just insane. I still now like I'm trying to figure out ski racing helmet questions I have as my kids get old enough to race and my own article gets fed to me and I'm like this isn't even <laughs> I know all this information I need new information. The article was hugely successful and I got no commendation. It was just kind of like, all right, what's the next article? The other big issue I had is that my boss, my like chief editor or whatever, for Ski Racing Magazine, didn't even ski race, had zero ski race experience. I'm not even sure that she ever skied. And it would be so frustrating because you would write these things about turn radius or you would write these things about different rules and regulations that had been implemented by USSA and they would edit it out and use like synonyms in the context of ski racing is super specific. So I would get all these comments for edit that made no sense if you had any familiarity with ski racing or even skiing in general. The next problem I had was that Ski Racing Magazine had, was shifting from a magazine to a website and I had experience with building websites, with writing for them. I knew how to like publish things on WordPress. I had all this experience and it was like very archaic. They would say, okay, you wrote this article, we have to send it to production. Get the images on there, make it look like a, and, and then they would upload a PDF or a JPEG of the actual printed magazine onto their website. And it was just like, it was so archaic and so slow to have to wait for something to go to production and come back. It was really, really frustrating to work in such a slow workflow and have things take so long when you're like, I could just publish this on WordPress. I can see the website right there. It also made it impossible for any of your articles to rank for anything because there was no SEO, it was just like a PDF. So I would go and put information into the actual WordPress thing because I had worked in SEO previously for just like a month or something 
and I was like, okay, if anyone wants to find my article, I have to actually like write these things in it. The next big problem I had was the kind of content they wanted me to write. My editor would say, oh, we don't want you to talk about the helmets because our sponsors, Uvex, Carrera, all these sponsors, they don't like what you're saying about helmets. The advertisers didn't like that. So I would get like feedback and pushback on the articles I wrote based on what the advertisers liked. And I get that you have to have some of that, but I, as far as like journalistic integrity, it felt very dirty to me and I didn't enjoy that part. The other problem I had was that the content that they wanted me to write had nothing to do with ski racing. They wanted like very Buzzfeed top 10 kind of articles. I don't know if you remember like what 2015 was like, but everything was kind of Buzzfeed top 10s. If you're a true skier, you'll do this. Except they wanted me to write about things that I had no idea about. They wanted me to do a top 10 list of fun resorts and après ski restaurants in France. I had never even been to France at the time. I had no idea and I told my editors, I said, what do you want me to say? I don't know anything about France. How am I gonna make a recommendation? They said, oh, just do some Googling and put together a list and I was like, I came to ski racing to talk about ski racing. Lastly, they would just like load you up with these articles on a spreadsheet and say, okay, you're gonna write all of these out, you're gonna pump these out. And I, at the time I was making 30K, like the level of scrutiny and the level of like pressure I got for how little I made was not worth it. And especially like I could barely make ends meet living in Park City, Utah, which if you guys are familiar with Park City, it's like very, very expensive. I remember there were days where I was like picking my daughter up from school and I would get a call saying, we need this article written early. We need you to send it over. And I'd be like, okay, well, let me just get home and send it. Oh, never mind. We'll just use the latest draft that we have in Google. I'm like, no, I've like worked days on this. Don't do that. And you know, they just hang up and that was it. I also had like big issues with actually getting interviews with ski racers. I thought that I would have this access baked in because people respected ski racing media or ski racing magazine, whatever it was called back then. And nobody would answer anything. I could maybe get a hold of like former racers or people who had just joined the team. But people like Lindsey, Vaughn, Julian Mancuso, I would send emails out and their publicists would sometimes email me back or just they'd completely ghost me. Nobody had any respect for Ski Racing Magazine. I'm not sure why, but by the time I got there, I could not get any interviews with anyone. And then I had these deadlines and they'd be like, how's this piece going? I'm like, I literally can't get a hold of Lindsey Vaughn, Julian Mancuso on site on Park City. So I'd like, try to chase these people down and just, I don't know, it was like an impossible feat. Oh, and also there were like a bunch of things that I made suggestions on like putting out video content to match with our articles or putting out audio content so people could listen to it. Again, things that were changing with web content at the time. And they like totally had no interest in it, had no desire. I was like, you could do this with your phone. This is easy. It's been very cathartic to be able to finally talk about the things I wanna talk about and be totally honest with my audience. I almost never even think about Ski Racing Magazine. I had to bring them up on a call recently because someone was asking about my experience and I was like, oh yeah, I did write for, <laughs> I did write for them. And I wrote some articles I'm still proud of that are still top ranking for the site. It probably still drives a lot of their traffic, but I, I got paid so little at the end of it I was telling them, hey, I can't afford to live in Park City anymore. This is crazy. I can't even afford to put my child in daycare full time. And they said, uh, okay, yeah, you can move to Vermont. So I set everything up to go back to Vermont, like register the U-Haul, everything, got all these expenses. And I was like, okay, I'll live somewhere that's more affordable. They fired me the next day. They said, okay, it's not working out. I don't know. I met some really cool people that worked there. I worked with Claire, who was amazing. She was really nice to me and taught me a lot. But overall, it was like a terrible experience. And it's one of those things you learn in your 20s that if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. But I am very grateful not to work there anymore. So I look at their content and it's awful. It's still back in like 2010, 2008. Their content is like four-way calls with Lindsey Vaughn, Darren Rawls, Marco Sullivan, some of the greatest ski racers of all time. And they're using like the little MacBook speakers and it just sounds awful. I was looking at the metrics. More people have watched Zach in his backyard with his 10 skis that are ancient. <laughs> you know, more people have watched Zach than watched Lindsey Vaughn. That is insane to me. That is crazy. Ski racing has been so in the past and we're just like completely refused to make any changes 
or you know address these kind of unethical things where you're talking about things you didn't actually experience and I'm not sure why it died I mean it could have just been some of the things that I experienced and they just kept going on it's hard to say exactly but I know that if you like type in ski racing to YouTube or Google it's not even the first result it's like way down there I think NCAA is up there obviously Lindsey Vaughn and Michaela Schifrin's like own channels are there and ski racing magazine it might as well not even exist at this point their content isn't good and you have like really good insightful skiers and they do almost nothing with it. I watched their top content was a like ski demo day that they hosted and it's literally just like this awkward slideshow. It also seems like ski racing in general, not just like ski racing the company or ski racing media, ski racing magazine, whatever they're called. I'm not even talking about that. Just ski racing in general seems to be less popular. Maybe I'm missing something, but I do not see much carving content. It seems like at least in the United States, people really just care about freestyle and powder. All of the content I see is kind of showcasing that. And I think ski racing, the sport did it to itself. It's so intense. The coaches I've had used to yell at us it's not fun and then you get something like freestyle skiing where it's just about having fun and exploring the mountain I get why that's becoming more popular and the sad thing is is that carving and ski racing is really fun but it's almost just been pummeled out of existence when Zach and I went up to Mount Hood we went into government camp and government camp has a history a deep history of ski racing ski racing camps you know kids running all over the camps and we went there during the peak time where you would normally see camps because I used to work these camps and there were almost no kids there the Ligeti Wybrek camp that I used to work at is still really successful, so it was cool to see them thriving, but I didn't see a lot of like the staples that I used to see. There weren't kids kind of running around government camp. And then when I got up there, I didn't see as many race clubs up in Mount Hood. Maybe it was just because it was a good winter, so this is all anecdotal. But I was in line with Burke Mount Academy Junior Racing there, okay? They got the jackets on. I grew up in the BMA junior program. I know how intense it is. And I saw this coach just yelling at these eight or nine year olds. What are you doing? Are you paying attention in line? Just going to town on them. And I was like, what are they like, eight? If, if anyone yelled at my kid about being in line and not paying attention, I would pull them from the program immediately. And I would guess that's why it's not that popular. Ski racing got way too intense and there's a lot of fun to be had with ski racing. And for some reason, the ski racing community just completely misses the point on that. So I don't know if ski racing is just dwindling in popularity. My theory is that carving in general will come back as people start to get older. A lot of the people that are kind of older lifetime skiers now, they grew up on straight skis, so it's not that big of a concern to them. But as my generation gets older, you can't do the jumps in parks forever. At least most people can't. And I think a lot of people as they get older and still want to experience the mountain and enjoy skiing are going to have to learn to carve. I think it'll come back full circle, but I think a lot of the really intense ski racing communities have totally burnt people out on ski racing and it makes them not want to worry about carving in the future. That's just my theory. As far as ski racing magazine, I don't know. I'm happy to be as far away from it as I can be, but I don't know. I just thought I'd bring it up. It was a terrible experience and I learned a lot of big life lessons about if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. So anyway, thanks for letting me rant about ski racing. I know normally I'm talking about ski reviews and gear reviews, but I just wanted to talk about it, I guess. Maybe this is more for me than you, but if you made it this far, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. As always, liking and subscribing helps me if you like the content. If you don't, don't worry about it, okay? But as always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. See ya.